I think I must have spoken to more students and graduates that want to work in banking and finance than anyone else in the world, and that's a big statement. Um, but we have the only training company that works with just with students and graduates who want to work in banking and finance. Um, we've got 100,000 people on a database who have all said, I want to work in banking and finance, please can you help me? Uh, we've had 10,000 people through a training program dedicated to helping uh, students and graduates not just get into banking and finance, but find out what their real ideal career is um, and then figure out how to get to the top of their game and whatever is important to you. One thing I'm not here to do today is to tell you what's important to you. Only you can determine that. And what I'd also like to tell you is that when you determine that, that is the key to you achieving anything that you want. When you have a very clear, specific goal of what you'd like to achieve, this gentleman would like to work in private wealth management after having three months' experience in Bulgaria. I guarantee you he will have a lot easier time figuring out how to get into private wealth management than someone that has not quite figured out what they want to do. And here's the number one thing that I see after dealing with 10,000 odd students and graduates who all want to work in banking and finance. Um, many people have come to study without a clear vision of what they actually wanted to get out of that study. Many people came to study because they didn't quite know what they wanted to do, so they did an MBA, they did a master's, they did something. Um, and hopefully at the end of that, they can figure out what they want to do. Well, what I've found is that by the end of it, they still don't know what they want to do. And they ply around for everything. Um, they ply around to be in every single role in banking and finance, and, you know, in a consultancy institution, in an accountancy institution. And now the markets are so tough, they get nothing. Um, and very often, if it's an international student, they end up going back to their country very frustrated um, and blame some other reason why they're not getting what they actually want to get. Um, the reason that I know that is because I've seen that story thousands of times over the last few years. In fact, not that exact story, but I've had a very similar story myself. Um, so, around about 10 years ago, there was nothing that I wanted more in the world than to work in banking and finance. And um, I didn't quite know how to achieve it. I didn't go to a top university. Um, I didn't get good grades at A-levels. I managed to get myself into a university in London called Kingston University, which is way down on the league table, not quite as high as um, University of Liverpool. Um, after three years of having a great time, I don't regret any of my time at university, but by the end of it, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't go to any of the careers presentations like this. I didn't invest any time into figuring out um, where I wanted to go in life. And by the end of it, I just started applying to graduate schemes. And uh, when I applied to graduate schemes, I didn't get any offers. In fact, what I normally bring with me on my presentation is a pile of letters, which is a prized possession of mine. And it's 100 rejection letters from every single financial institution that I could find that had the words banking and finance in them. Now, I was applying for investment banking. I was applying for investment institutions. I was applying for accounting. I was applying for cleaning if it was within a bank. I wanted anything that had the words banking and finance in. And guess what? I got nothing. So my response was that it must be the reason, must be that I'm not educated enough and I didn't go to a top university. So I started blaming that excuse for a while. Um, and then I decided to do something about it. So I got myself on a train up to Manchester and got an offer to do a master's in economics at University of Manchester. Had a great time for a year again. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, but then at the end of the year, I had the exact same experience. And in fact, this time I managed to find about 125 different companies to apply to. Um, and when I applied to all of them, I got a couple back. I got a few interviews and I got some valuable you know, feedback on why, I, why they weren't offering me a job at the time. Um, and this was during the dot-com boom and bust. It was when the bust actually came through. So it's not as bad market as it is today. Today is the worst market that we've had for an awful long time. As I said, I'm not here to tell you that it's all going to be easy. Some of the messages that I'm going to tell you today you won't like to hear. But what I can tell you is that once you know what the situation is, and only then can you be empowered to actually get to where you want to go and make the difference that you need to make in order to get to where you want to go. So I found that there's actually three things that you need in order to get to where you want to go. One, you've got to know where you're at right now. And right now we're in a stinking economy, in a stinking banking system that needs lots and lots of repair. But here's the funny thing. Some of the greatest businesses in the world were all bought out of a, were all created out of a stinking economy like today. If you want to name a few, Apple, that's a pretty good company. Microsoft, that was a pretty good company. Um, Disney, that was a pretty good company. They all came from a stinking environment like the one we have today. So what happens in a stinking environment like we have today is those doing things the old way will end up getting stinking results. 
But those of you that look at the current situation and try and seek the opportunity in what is coming out of this stinking environment will realise that we have a banking system that's completely broken and completely corrupt. And what that means is that all of you, as the next generation of banking and finance leaders, uh, we're going to be pointing towards you to actually make a difference and fix all these issues. Because the banking system's not about to go away. Yes, it could collapse, but the government will prop it up, as we have seen time and time again. If the government won't prop it up, the central bank will prop it up. So this system's here to stay, and it needs to be fixed. And there's, I've dedicated the last five years of my life to figuring out how to, how to fix that system. So eventually, um, I got myself a good mentor, and my mentor told me a lot of the lessons I'd like to share with you today. Um, he told me, Simon, you're completely unfocused. He told me, Simon, it's not what you know, it's who you know. He told me, Simon, how many of the people in the area that you want to get into want to work, you know, do you know right now? He said, Simon, um, what have you actually done to demonstrate the skills that they actually wanted? Do you know what they actually want? Or are you guessing and studying and assuming that that's what they actually want? Well, I was guessing and assuming that they actually want. Um, so I eventually managed to knock on the door of a, a company in, in uh, Manchester in a place called Deansgate. And I knocked on the door and I managed to persuade someone to give me a temping job as a tea, job, job, excuse me, as a tea boy. And as, after working as a tea boy, it was for a company called TD Waterhouse. Anyone heard of TD Waterhouse? No? Well, it's one of the largest brokers in Canada, but maybe you haven't heard about it because it's not one of the sexy investment banks like JP Morgan. Um, but I managed to get myself a, a tea boy offer. Now, after being the best I could possibly be, after studying the exams, after figuring out what it takes to make it in that industry, and boy, was I under some illusion, disillusion at the time about what it actually took to make it. Um, but when I did, um, I got myself a job as a stockbroker. Um, and when I worked as a stockbroker, I managed to increase my network and, and meet some of the traders in London. And through a process, which I'd like to share with you today, which I wish someone had taught me a long time ago, um, I managed to get myself an offer as a market maker for an investment bank called KBC. Now, there's three types of investment banks that you might, it's probably worth writing this down because they require three different strategies. So if you're applying to get into investment banking or any financial institution, there's three different types of companies. One of them is what's called a bulge bracket. A bulge bracket is a large financial institution that you all know. They've all got graduate schemes. They're called RBS, they're called JP Morgan, they're called Goldman Sachs. They're dealing on with IPOs for Facebook, for Groupon, all the sexy deals that you might know about right now. Um, they're the first type of financial institution. They are completely broken and they are not hiring right now. They do have graduate schemes and they will still present around university and pretend that they're hiring, but they're not hiring right now. Um, they, are, they do have a few jobs. They tend to be reserved for those who go to top universities. Does that mean you have to go to a top university? Well, in almost all cases, yes. But I know many people that have got in there without even a degree. Now, my question to you is what do they do differently? And that's one of the things I'd like to share with you today. Because really, um, only about you know, five, one to five percent of those people will get in without going to Oxford, Cambridge, or one of the very tops. Um, but there are that one to five percent, and I'd like to share with you some of the things that they're actually doing differently. Is that okay with you? Would that be useful? Yeah. Okay, excellent. So the second type of company is what we call a mid-cap. Now, a mid-cap is a medium-sized uh, financial institution. Medium-sized financial institutions are not doing well right now, but they're doing a lot bigger than, they're doing a lot better than some of the large companies that you might have heard about right now. The reason being is because all of the issues that came out of the financial crisis tend to come from large financial institutions that were leveraging their balance sheets way beyond um, any comprehension that we can, even, what we can even think about right now. And what happened is a lot of that business left the large companies and has suddenly, during the, around about the 2008 to 2009 period, um, was redistributed to a lot of the medium-sized companies. Now, the third type is what we call a boutique. A boutique is a very, very lean, small financial institution. They tend to be, um, while there's in every single sector, but they tend to be hedge funds, uh, boutique private equity houses, boutique investment banks. They consist of a load of Goldman Sachs employees that decided, well, I've got a billion, you know, I've got my 10 million in bonus. Why don't I go and set up my own outfit? I think I can do a better job than Goldman Sachs. Why don't we get a team of specialists who all specialize in a particular area? And rather than sharing all those uh, fees with Goldman Sachs, we can take them on ourselves. And also, they tend to take on a graduate or two 
uh, to help them with a lot of the, you know, the back office stuff, um, to help them do the stuff that they, can't, that they just don't want to do at the moment. So what th the difference is, is that if you work for a large financial institution, I find this is something that a lot of people get wrong. If you work for a large financial institution, you are going to be doing a very monotonous job. You're going to be doing a very specific thing, and you're going to be competing with a lot of people um, in order to stand out. And those people are going to be very intelligent, and they're going to be very good at their job. They're going to do 100 hours a week in some cases if they work in investment banking. You will dedicate your whole life to that investment bank. There will not be any life on the side. I'm telling you that. If you work for a medium-sized financial institution, then you're going to get a lot more exposure to the business side. So for those of you that raised your hand saying you'd like to get into business, my, my suggestion to you is that you'd much rather work for a medium-sized company. You're going to see way more of the business. You're going to understand way more of how it actually works. But you won't have the sexy Goldman Sachs on your CV. And the Goldman Sachs on your CV has a lot of clout. It's got a lot of clout. So these are all things for you to consider. Now, if you work for a boutique, it's going to be really hard because they're going to expect you to be ready for the role. They ain't going to train you up. They're just going to expect you to be ready. And I know people that are graduates that have gone in, and I can give you countless examples, and I'll tell you some of the stories, that have gone straight in at the boutique level. And one of, one of our clients, Rodrigo, he, went, he became a director of a hedge fund within a couple of years. Now, you could not that could not happen at Goldman Sachs. You know, he ended up getting shares in the company as well. That can only happen at a boutique. So what I've found is that everyone thinks, um, what I've, I've, I often got criticism because I've been helping students get secu secure careers in banking and finance for five years now. Um, and um, I, I often get criticized because they say, you know, well, you didn't work at Goldman Sachs. You didn't work at UBS. Well, no, I didn't work at Goldman Sachs. I didn't work at UBS. But I know tons of people and have helped tons of people get in there. And if I wanted that job right now, I could assure you, using the things that I'd like to teach you, I will get that job if I wanted it. But I'm unemployable because I'm an entrepreneur. And I found that entrepreneurs um, and people that want to work in investment bank is very good to get that experience. But if you're an entrepreneur, you're unemployable. Um, and nothing will stop you from pursuing your business. And that's what I found with myself. Now, I'm not here to say that you should follow my path. I'm here to say that we all have a unique path. Your job is to figure out what that path is. The sooner you figure that out, the more you can take the right action and decisions in order to get to where you want to go. While you don't know that, you will be flapping around like a chicken for the rest of your life, never getting anywhere to where you want to go. Until you know exactly where you want to go, then you can step about what's the plan to achieve it. And it will take you a long time. I found one thing, especially in the economy and environment we live today, no one's ever really worked harder than what we do work, you know, to achieve things today. It's a really competitive market out there. It requires excellence. And excellence is the following to me. It does not mean that you've got all the top grades. That's great. That all helps. I'm not here to undermine your education or the things that you've done. But what it means to me is that you figure out exactly what your area of passion is, and you pursue it like no one else will pursue it. You work when no one else will work. You do the hours that no one else is willing to put in. And that's all that it can do in order to achieve what you want here today. But here's the thing. If you're struggling with that, it's because you haven't found your path of least resistance. Your path of least resistance is the time when effort becomes effortless. Now, I don't know why I went into all that, but I thought it was worth sharing before I even start. Um, but my, so I went and then got a job as a market maker for the London Stock Exchange. Uh, before then, I, after that rather, I got a job in corporate finance working for an investment bank. My job was to help venture capitalists exit their businesses onto the London Stock Exchange. I learned an awful lot. Um, I then decided that after, after working in an investment bank and meeting tons and tons of venture capitalists, I was really, really curious about the people on the other side of the desk. I was really curious about how someone, how someone takes a business that they start in their bedroom and a few years later they're floating it on the stock market for millions if not billions. And so after really, you know, I really decided that that's where I need to be. I was on the wrong side of the desk. So I started in business. Um, I set up a training company for students seeking careers in banking five years ago. It was angel funded by a billionaire called Peter Hargreaves, who owns one of the largest wealth management companies in the UK called Hargreaves Lansdowne. Um, and very recently, um, I started a company called Bank to the Future. And Bank to the Future is a social network financial institution that helps businesses raise funds without going through the traditional methods that banks go through now. So that's what I'm up to right now. So um, in those years, I've seen a lot. <clears throat> 
I also happen to have a not-for-profit, and I work with a not-for-profit called Positive Money. For the last five years, we've been pitching the Bank of England, we've been pitching government, we've been pitching parliament um, for the need for, to reform the way that money is actually created in our economy. Um, now, when I did that, I, when I first started doing that, it was before the financial crisis, and I got a lot of ridicule. Um, because I've been talking about how economists have been lying for students for years with their economic theories, and those theories are responsible for the crisis that we're in today. Um, and they're still being taught today, and my mission has been to change what's actually taught because they're lies, and they're not true. Um, so we've been working on that for five years. The crisis hit, that got us a lot of attention. I wrote a couple of books. One was Student CEO, which you all get a copy of here today. Um, for students who want to climb to the top or figure out what their passion is and how to get to where they want to go. And the second is Bank to the Future, which is a, a book on the future of banking and where we're headed over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, you'll probably get a clue by the subtitle because the book's called Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. Um, and that was before all the Euro crisis uh, that, that that book was actually written. So there's a little introduction. Um, here's, here's some summaries of what I'd like to do today. Um, one thing that I want you to know is that I was told by my mentor that it's not what you know, it's, it's who you know. And I found that that to be is, is not the case at all. Um, I found, yes, it's who you know, but it's also what you know. Because the only way you can get to know who you should be knowing is by speaking the talk and talking the talk. Because no one wants to, to be connected with an incredible, unconnected person. So when I was a student or graduate, I was an incredible, unconnected person. I didn't have any kind of value proposition that I could give someone. All I was doing was telling my, everyone, I've got a master's in economics. And no one was interested in hearing that I had a master's in economics. Why was I telling that to everyone? Because I've been told my whole life that if I get a master's in economics, then I'd get a good job. And so I thought, right, I've done the master's in economics. I found it really hard. I'm not naturally academic. Um, I found it really, really challenging. But I got there in the end. Um, and I, wanted, I was really, really proud of what I'd achieved. So I tell everyone, and here's what I found. Everyone else had a master's in economics as well. And everyone else had an MBA, and they all went to better universities. And then everyone else had a better master's and a master's in finance. Um, and I just found myself in this, this market where I was trying to sell myself on a proposition that no one really cared about or wanted to hear. The way I used to introduce myself when I found a useful connection was, hi, I'm Simon Dixon. I've done a master's in economics. And immediately, when I hear people say that and introduce themselves, um, immediately we delete what they're actually saying. Because it implies to us, because that's the standard now. Everyone's got that. It's like, you know, it's, it's not a distinguisher anymore. We had this flood of people all decide to come to this country and study. And that all happened at the same time. And we, we, are, we are inundated with master's degrees, with MBAs with academics, with uh, you know, students. These are all important. I'm not saying it's not. It's going to serve you. I'm very, very glad I got it. Because when I tell people today, um, when I'm invited on TV to talk about the economy, um, I, I would have been discredited if I didn't have my master's in economics. It helps. But that in itself is not the piece. And the reason that I find a lot of students make the same mistakes that I did is simply because they worked bloody hard to get there. And they're proud of it. And so was I. Um, so here's what I found. Um, this may sound like a cliche, and you won't even understand it now until you've implemented it. But everything, all your success, comes from the people that you know. Everything is about who you know. Degrees don't matter when you know all the right people. You know, applications don't matter when you know all the right people. Nothing, in fact, you don't apply for jobs when you know the right people. Now, I didn't know anyone. And maybe some people say, well, I haven't got any contacts, Simon. You're fortunate enough. You've, done all the, you've got all these VC contacts. You've got these invest. I built them from scratch. I didn't know anyone. I came to London without knowing anyone. Okay? So they can, you can all build that right now. Now, here's the thing. It takes a long time. It does take a long time, but I can definitely shortcut that process for you. Um, so it's also what you know, because here's what I found. Uh, people don't want to know you unless you speak the right language. People don't want to know you unless you have referrals from the right people. People don't want to know you unless you come across as credible. People don't want to know you, even if you're completely credible, you've got all the degrees, but you can't communicate who you are. And unfortunately, you could have everything, but if you can't pitch your value, then no one will find out what you're worth. 
So we've got, we're in this environment where you have to know exactly how to pitch yourself, you have to have the credentials, you have to have the credibility. And what I've found is that a lot of people coming out from university have spent all their time on one piece of the equation. Now if someone had told me that I was meant to be building my connections throughout the whole of university and that no one else would be doing that and I could be that 1%, then I, it, would have, it would have saved me an awful lot of time. So <clears throat> that's what I found. Um, here's what it takes to succeed in banking and finance. In fact, whatever you want to achieve. I, I niche this to banking and finance because it's what I've known, it's what I've studied, it's what I've been dealing with for the last decade or so. Your success is the interaction between these three circles. <clears throat> Strategy, that says psychology, it's hanging off the end, and the third thing is jargon. So let me give you a classic example. If you're applying for graduate schemes right now, you're following the wrong strategy. Because graduate schemes are just about the worst way to secure a career right now. Why? Because none of them have jobs. There's few of them reserved for the top universities. Um, and I'm not here to tell you don't apply for those, because if you do everything right and you get yourself a 1% application, 99% of those applications are useless. I've seen them. 99% are just completely useless. But 1% are pretty good. So it requires you to have a 1% application. But here's the thing, applying for graduate schemes is just about the worst, most ineffective use of your time right now. Um, and, and that's what all the other students are doing right now. What did we have? So now the student fees have gone right up and people have stopped coming to university. You know, as much for any people. But before that, we had a time of record numbers of people going to university. I think at the peak we had 650,000 people graduate in the UK. Okay? Now all of those people we're applying to graduate schemes because that's all they know. That's what they were told. That's what the company presentation says. Somebody came along from Goldman Sachs and said, apply to our company. That's how you get a job. So they all did that, and none of them got the job. But it's just about the most ineffective way. <clears throat> so in the current market, you need to have a completely different strategy. What I'd like to share with you is seven trends that we're currently in and why graduate schemes are the most ineffective in light of the seven trends that we're actually in right now. So your strategy has to be based upon the current market. I've found that strategy is all about timing. If any of you want to be traders, the strategy you follow is all about timing, when you're in, when you're out. Now the strategy changes all the time. So you need to continually be on top of what's the right strategy to follow right now. The only way to be on top of that is to be in the right network where you have data continually coming in about the latest bits of information. One thing that we have right now is we are in an information economy. We all have too much information. How many people think they need more information right now? I don't think anyone thinks they need more information. We're inundated. If you check your email right now, I know I've got 100 emails by the time this is actually finished. And yeah, we need better information. Absolutely. That's what you need. You need better information. The only way you get better information is by having a network around you of credible sources that feed you the information that you need. And the only way they feed you the information you need is if you feed them the information you need. And I like to share some strategies that you can follow in order to do that. So here's what I found. If you're following the wrong strategy, it doesn't matter if you got first, it doesn't matter if you got masters, it doesn't matter if you are the best and most knowledgeable about finance. If you're following the wrong strategy, you're not going to get the career or where you want to go. Okay? So the second thing is about psychology. So you could be, you could even, I could tell you a strategy which will work and I will share some strategies of what you should be doing right now to get into the banking and finance sector. But if your attitude stinks, you won't get in. I find many, many people that, um, that, <coughs> that you know, they're, they're, they're arrogant about their achievement um, in, in the academic field. And that is a very, very, very off-putting thing. If their mindset isn't right, I'd like to tell you, an, uh, let, let me give you an example with something we can all relate to. Um, how many of you, if I said right now that your whole family would die over the next, the ne well, next year, if you don't figure out over the next year how to lose one stone, how many of you think, if you believed, you'd obviously have to believe me, otherwise you wouldn't take it seriously, but if you believed that I was going to murder your entire family, and all you had to do was figure out how to lose a stone over the next year. How many of you would know how to do that? Raise your hand for me. Would you not know how to do it? I don't know what lose stone means. 
Okay, sorry, um, lose uh, an amount of weight. Um, so for, w what do you work with in Bulgaria? What's, how do you weigh each other? In kilos. kilos. How many kilos is a stone? Anyone got any? Six and a half kilos. Could you lo lose six and a half kilos? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. You would because that's so important to you, right? Okay. So we all know exactly how to lose weight. How many of you pro probably have a good idea of how to be fit and healthy? Raise your hand if you know how to be fit and healthy. Come on, you don't have to do a degree in it. You've just got to stop eating McDonald's and you've got to go out there and you've got to exercise and move, all right? We all know that. You just move, drink some water instead of Coke and do the things that we all know that we should be doing. So each and every one of us have the knowledge and information of how to be fit and healthy, right? We all probably know that it's a good idea. How many people would agree with the following phrase? In order to live a pretty fulfilling life over the next 10, 15, 20 years, it's probably a good idea to consider our health. How many people would agree with that? <coughs> Excellent, okay. So we all know that we should be fit and healthy. We all know how to be fit and healthy, but how many of us are fit and healthy? What is the difference between someone that goes to the gym every single day and someone that doesn't? Is it because, um, is it because, is it, well, well, willpower, look in, what is willpower? Is it simply because they must go to the gym every day rather than should? We all know we should go to the gym every day, probably. Most of, I mean, maybe some of us don't know that, but we all probably know that we should, but not all of us do. The only difference is that they have triggered off something in their brain and that that there's a psychological trigger where no matter what, they have to go to the gym because being fit and healthy is far too important to them and the pain of not being fit and healthy is never, ever, ever worth it no matter what's happening in the world. And by the way, this is how we all make our decisions every single day. The reason that you're at university is because you determine that the pleasure of receiving a degree or getting a master's, the credentials that, you're, that people around you would get, the career it would possibly give you, how your family would feel, how you would feel, is so important that it's worth the pain of studying for exams, and that's a real pain sometimes, right? So we all make these, these decisions about what pain means to us and what pleasure means to us, and that is you. Every action you take is a psychological decision based upon your background of what pain and pleasure means to you. We can change those triggers at any point. And that is what will motivate you. That is what will get you out of bed. That is what will get you the things that we need to do. So I found that if somebody is psycho, you know, I could teach you that having a positive attitude, um, I've, got a, I've got a philosophy, which is expect the best, but prepare for the worst. Expect the best, but prepare for the worst. Because I know by if you just do things which are quite rational, if you only do things that you think you can do, you'll never make progress. Because if you think about it, we all have a circle around us. That's called a comfort zone. Anytime we want to achieve something bigger, we have to step outside that comfort zone. But what happens when we step outside the comfort zone is that we actually are stepping out of what is normal to us. And we're doing something where we're uncertain about the result that we'll actually achieve. So anytime you step outside there, that's you taking things to another level in a moment of uncertainty. In order to achieve anything, you have to do uncertainty. You didn't know you would, what would happen when you came to university, okay? So that's the whole thing, is stepping outside that comfort zone. So if you are just continually doing things where you know you'll get the result, you won't get to where you want to go, because you have to have that uncertainty. But also you have to prepare for um, the worst case scenario, because very often the worst case scenario happened. Life stinks sometimes, doesn't it? But if we fought like that all the time, we'd just never get out of bed. We wouldn't bother. What's the point anyway? But very often that's the result that we actually get because life takes a lot of work and getting into banking and finance will take a lot of work from you as well. So I could tell you that having a positive attitude will really help and it will. But if you've got a positive attitude, I will get into banking and finance. I will get into banking and finance. Why that will help, because that attitude will mean that you'll take the action you need to take in order to figure out how to get there. If you're following the wrong strategy, you won't get there. You'll just get a lot of pain and you'll be continually motivating yourself in order to continue up that positive mental attitude. Okay? So these on their own do not work. Now what I've found is that if you don't talk the talk and walk the walk, then no one will be interested in you. 
No one will be interested in you. You have to talk to people on their level. Now that is the key to influence. The key to influence is connecting with somebody by talking to them on their match, what, what they're interested in and matching your interest. And you know, you have those moments when you, you're really struggling to speak to someone and then suddenly you find out that you both love Chelsea Football Club and all of a sudden the environment changed and you've just influenced at that point, okay? So your, your job in, is, is to combine these three skills together. If you combine the right strategy to become connected with the right mindset of approaching people when if, if the big part of your mind is probably saying, oh, what do they want to speak to me? What am I going to say to the CEO? God was saying, what? You know, while those games are all playing in your head, if you can just control that, get your psychology right, get your strategy right, and then talk the right thing. And also be willing to make mistakes because you'll screw up all the time because I screw up every day. But if you're willing to learn from those mistakes, then in this interaction is where all your connections happen. And if you build your connections, you will get anywhere that you want to go, no matter what it is that you want to achieve. If you continually build new connections, because new connections means new data. New data means new information, which means that you can actually um, get to where you want to go because there's no such thing as a self-made millionaire. Never met one. Never met a self-made millionaire. They all, play, they all play a game with their connections. And all of them have made each other rich. Okay? <coughs> so there we go. Um, what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to go into these three of how it relates to banking and finance. And the first thing, uh, when Fiona invited me here today, um, she wanted me to give an overview of banking and finance so you can understand the jargon. Because here's the key. The key to getting your strategy right, I said it, is timing. The key to getting your psychology right is the environment that you hang around with. You are your environment. If you spend a lot of time with students and graduates, you will get similar results as students and graduates. If you add one billionaire to your network, you will get different results. Here's the thing. Um, they did a study and they found that if you, take, if, you all jot, if you jot down the five people that you spend most of your time with, if you jot down the five people that you spend most of your time with, and then you take the average salary that they all earn and average it out, you'll find that that's your salary. If you add one billionaire to that, it completely changes the game because the information and data that you get completely changes. So what shapes us most is our environment. Why, do, why are countries in poverty? Now, there's many reasons why they're in poverty, but in general, they don't have access to information. They don't have access to new data sets. They don't have access to resources because all around them, they're surrounded by poverty. And if you can inject one mentor into there, one mentor, it can make a tremendous difference to that community because you can teach them a new way. At the end of the day, as long as people have access to internet connection, we're pretty much on a level playing field now. If we all have access to an internet connection, a smartphone and a laptop, we can all start a business, we can all do what Mark Zuckerberg did, we can all get into bank and finance, we can all do many, 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 many things. We can create iPhone apps, we can do many things. What technology has done is it has completely changed the game. Now, there's many people that don't have access to an internet connection, and so that tends to create an environment of poverty. But your environment is exactly who you will become. Who you surround yourself with is who you become. That's why we tend to adopt the beliefs of our parents. We tend to adopt the beliefs of our countries. We tend to adopt the beliefs of our peer groups because we're all, in, we're all just dictated by our environment, who we spend our time with. Now, what's the key to jargon? The key to jargon is we are all inundated with information. We're inundated with data. Well, how do we know what emails to delete and what emails to read? There's only one way, and that's knowing where you're trying to go in life. And when you know when you're trying to go in life, you know what information to delete and what information to take in. Who's an important connection to make? When you are having a conversation with a potential connection and you know where you want to go, that conversation will be different. It will be completely different. And they will look at you differently because they'll be able to, if you can clearly communicate, you know, my name's Simon Dixon, here's what I'm trying to achieve, or here's who I am, they can say, well, I'm not really interested in that, and that's good. Or they can say, I'm not really interested in that, I don't know how to help you, but you should meet Dave. You know, Dave, is, he's, he's, the wife, he's the wealth management guy, you should really meet him. Okay? Now, when you're clear about what you want, there's way more opportunities. When you're trying to adjust and, and fit into the environment, you get no opportunities. So the key to jargon is knowing what you want because there's too much information and you need to figure out like a laser 
where you need to channel all the energies and what information to learn. If you want to be a trader, you need to learn completely different things to if you want to be an investment banker. I didn't know that. Okay? I had to go the hard way in order to do that. <clears throat> okay, so what I'd like to do right now for you, if we can see everything okay, is I'm just going to give you an overview. You may, um, there'll be a video recording of this if you'd like to get access to the video at some point once it's edited. Um, but also, it's probably worth writing these things down um, because here's the, if you want to work in banking and finance, here's the types of focus that you might need to do. First thing, I'm going to go through the different types of financial institutions. So remember I said there's three different types of financial institutions. There's a bulge bracket, large company with graduate scheme. There's a medium-sized company, and there's a boutique company which consists of five to six or ten or twenty uh, ex-Goldman Sachs employees that have all created their own boutique company. Um, the universal bank is the bank that we all probably apply to. The universal bank does everything. And the universal bank will be no more because we've had a new um, report in the UK called the Vickers Report um, and said that we have to separate the different types of banks. The reason being is because there's complete conflicts between the different types of banks. And the only way, or one of the only ways to get back to some kind of sustainability is to separate the different types of banks. Now that's something that happened in the past in the last Great Depression of 1933 called the Glass-Steagall Act, which was an act in order to separate these two types of banking. Commercial banking, um, you can't see that if uh, it's the end, but that says commercial banking. Uh, commercial banking, essentially, if under a universal bank you have different types of banking. A commercial bank is a bank for, um, for companies. So while you all have a credit and debit card and an overdraft, I'm sure you do, um, and your wages come in or your money comes in or your loan comes in and your expenditure goes out, so do companies and that's called commercial banking. Um, the reason that banking and finance is a bit tricky to get your grips around is because I spent the, the, the past, and I still to this day spend my time, but the last five years trying to figure out what everything is and why, everything, why everyone calls it something different. In the UK, a commercial bank tends to refer to a company, a, the, the banking dealing with companies. In the US, they refer to commercial banks as what we call retail banks. And retail banks are all the banks that me and you use, individual people. We put our money in, we put our money out. That's a retail bank. And the second type of bank that sits under the universal bank is investment banking. Now, investment banking um, is, well, there's a number of different activities uh, uh, that are included in it. But it tends to generally be um, big, big companies, big um, looking to raise finance, or big financial institutions looking to achieve some kind of result. And an investment bank essentially creates some kind of product to sell to them. It is why an investment bank is called, the, the, in the city, we've got two sides to the city, the sell side and the buy side. The sell side is the institutions that create products in order to sell to people. The buy side are the people that have tons of money and buy those products on behalf of other people or, or on themselves. So the investment bank sits on the sell side of um, the, the, the city, as it were, or banking and finance. The third type is what we call an investment institution. So under this universal bank, a universal bank has a division for, called uh, investments. An investment institution is the, the, what we call the buy side. So let me just recap. You've got a universal bank that does everything. So let's give an example. You've got Barclays Group. And Barclays Group has several different divisions. We've got Barclays Wealth. Barclays Wealth is where they take high net worth money and they buy products in order to turn that money into more money. And why do people give their money to Barclays Wealth? Because they know how to buy products that will turn that money into more money, apparently. Didn't quite work out that way, but you, you, you very often give your money to an investment institution, the buy side. But a universal bank has a separate division called an investment banking which sells products. Now, can you see why there might be a conflict of interest there? When you're creating products that you need to sell, and also you're managing people's money who buys that product, could this person have a conversation with this person over, over dinner and see if you can sell and offload some rubbish to them. Happens all the time, all the time. <clears throat> and then you also have uh, commercial banking. Now, here's the thing. In commercial banking, what you tend to do is you, t you, do this, you, you deal with simplistic products. You, t you, take, you take people's money. Um, and here's what economics has been teaching. And this is the lie that I've been uh, preaching for the last five years. 
Um, economics teaches that a bank is an intermediary between a borrower and a lender, which is an absolute lie. It's not at all. A bank is not an intermediary between a borrower and lender, and if you make that assumption, all of the economic theories that we're running our economy off are completely wrong. Because a bank is actually, a retail commercial bank is actually a creator of money. 97% of our money is created by a bank. So when you take out a mortgage, that's not somebody else's savings. It's brand new money created out of thin air. Okay? So the reason that retail banks dominate the world and make a lot of money is because they've got a license to create 97% of our money supply. So the reason that governments really care that a bank doesn't go bankrupt is because wiping out 97% of our money supply would be the biggest depression we've ever experienced in the history of the world. So if anyone says you should let a bank go bust, they're not quite understanding the way that banking works. Okay? So the commercial bank, however, they take people's money, essentially, and they're allowed to leverage that up. Um, leverage means make more out of having a little bit. Um, and very often they can invest that in investment banking products, which means that the reason we had this separation recently is because they found that people were taking depositors' money, speculating on it, um, investment banks were creating commodity products, futures products, you know, all these, these, these crazy products, um, and taking risk with people's money. And all of a sudden, but why? Because the government has guaranteed this sector. They've said if anything goes wrong with this, we'll guarantee it. Um, so we have this massive conflict of interest and, and cycle of boom and bust consequently because of this crazy system that we operate in today called banking. Um, so what happens in investment banking? Well, the, you could split an investment bank into two further. The first is the primary market. So if you look down, what we're doing is essentially anything underneath. This is investment banking, this is all universal banking, this is investment institutions, this is commercial banking. In an investment bank, you have the primary market. So what that means is exactly what Facebook is doing right now. Facebook is looking to raise £5 billion in order to acquire a ton of companies and, in my forecast, to become a bank. Um, I think Facebook's going to become one of the largest financial institutions in the world with their database of 800 uh, million users. And they're moving into financial products um, with Facebook credits, and Google's also moving into financial products with their Google Wallet. Um, and that's going to be a, a continual shift because banks are completely out of favor, and we all love Google and Facebook, so they're going to take the front end while banks take the back end because the customers don't want to deal with them anymore because they've got such a bad rep. That's my forecast of where we're going. So what I think you're going to see is some of the biggest brands that you know are going to become financial institutions, some of the ones that you love, trust, um, and you know, because financial institution is the, the, you know, one of the richest industries out there. <clears throat> um, the primary market is where people raise money in the first place. So what does an investment bank have? They have access to money. Why? Because they have relationships with tons of money. Okay? So if you need to raise money, then you can turn your company into a product that they call a stock. And that stock can then float on the, um, float on the market and you can sell that to someone else. So Mark Zuckerberg wants to exit some, and the, the VCs that, that invested in um, Facebook want to exit some of their cash or they also want to gain access to new cash. So they go to a bank and uh, Goldman Sachs were meant to get the deal but Morgan Stanley got it instead. Um, and um, they, they then raise the five billion because the investment bankers go out and pitch a world saying you should buy this product. And they structure it and they create it. Okay? That's the primary market. Now what happens um, <clears throat> The people that deal with the primary market, they are often called corporate financiers. So corporate financiers, that's what I used to do. What I used to do is I used to take um, a, a venture capital trust, and a venture capital is a group of, um, they, they invest in early stage businesses. Um, and they pool people's money and invest in earlier stage businesses. And a venture capitalist typically is looking for five years to sell their investment at 10 times what they bought it for. The, the only way for them to do that is to sell it to someone. So they build relationships with investment banks and, and corporate financiers continually knock on their doors in order to say, why don't you take the company public? And taking the company public is a way of accessing everybody, a massive pool of money, which is ordinary people that want to invest in shares and also high net worths that want to invest in shares. So you have a corporate finance division that advises people because that's an extremely complex process. Um, and they advise people of how to actually do that. There's a number of different ways that you could do that. Um, there's, I mean, main, essentially, 
It's not completely true, but essentially there's only two real ways of raising money. Either you borrow it through uh, the debt markets or you offer shares through what we call the equity capital markets. Okay? Am I going too fast? Anyone got this? Is this making sense? Anyone got lost? Anyone got any questions on what I've gone through there? Cool, I'll assume we're all um, on, the, on the right pace. Now, why do they, what, what else does an investment bank provide? Now, why do you think Morgan Stanley um, got the deal over Goldman Sachs? Anyone got any ideas? Why did Facebook use Morgan Stanley instead of Goldman Sachs? Anyone got a guess? Um, lower fees. I doubt it's lower fees because they don't care about the fees. They'll just pass them on to the investor. Future what, sorry? Future, for example, they're just doing IPO now. Yeah. Future sales shares. Sure. Yeah. If I'm interpreting you correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I think you're saying is that they have a secondary market. And what a secondary market means is that they will have a very active market where people can buy and sell shares. So if you invested and you need that cash, you can easily sell it. And that's called a stock market. And this is where a load of traders um, get together and they put buyers and sellers together continually. They have relationships with all the buyers and all the sellers. They put them together. But the, the secondary market for an investment bank, if you and me want to call an investment bank and sell our shares, they're going to say, go away. They're going to say, go to someone like TD Waterhouse, who I started as a stockbroker for. And the reason that the difference is, is that the secondary market for investment banks, they, they deal in you know, shares in the millions. If you want to deal with shares in the tens of thousands or thousands, then you have to go to a stockbroker. Okay? So in order to speak to an investment bank and a trader on what we call the secondary market, which is the second hand market, essentially, so that you can sell your shares or you can sell your products. I'm using the shares example because it's easier to understand, but there's other products as well. Um, on the secondary market, um, you, you have to actually qualify and do some exams in order to speak to a trader. So I worked as what's called a market maker for an investment bank. And my job was just to speak to stockbrokers. Um, and the stockbrokers had all done their exams so they could just speak to me because we speak a different language. So a typical conversation would be like they'd ring up and they'd say, hi, I'm three offered 30, two offered 36, and six offered in 30 for half a bar. Make sense to anyone? Didn't make sense to me when I first started. It took me a year to figure out what the hell they were talking about. Why? Because I work for a mid-cap, and a mid-cap don't train you. They expect you to just be able to do it and figure it out yourself. If you work for Goldman Sachs, they're going to put you through a six-month training program where you figure out what the hell I just said. Okay? So that's the downside and the upside of whether you work for a large company or a small company. A smaller company, rather. The, the medium-sized company, they don't have the resources to train you as much because they need you to make a profit. And by the way, that's the key. Um, the key to being able to secure a career in banking and finance is the following. It's not your degree. They use that as a filter. It's not your degree. It's can you add more value to the company than, they, than you're going to cost them in wages. That's it. That's all you need to do to secure a career. You need to prove that you can add more value to the company than you cost them in wages. Because otherwise you're an expense. And expenses don't get jobs in the current market. Okay? Ruthless, brutal, but that's how it is. <coughs> um, so yeah, that's the, that's the secondary market. <coughs> so there's some crossovers here between commercial banking and investment banking, and the first is called structured products. Structured products you may have heard about. They've, they've, they've recently been renamed as toxic assets. Um, essentially, what they've done is the commercial bank has gone out to the world and said, can you mortgage brokers please find me as many people that want to buy houses as possible? Don't really care where they come from. I don't care whether they can afford it. Just find them, please. And so mortgage brokers go out and find as many people that are looking to borrow money because they can sell them to a commercial bank. The commercial bank will then find all these mortgages, give them to an investment bank. They'll structure a product. And then they'll take that product and they'll sell it to the investment institutions, the people that have money. Where do they get their money? That tends to be our pension money. So we're all interrelated in this, in this bomb, I guess, this circle. And these structured products are essentially um, grouping together. And then what you can do is you can, you can then allow people to buy those products without having all the money. So what do you do when you take out a mortgage? Essentially, you want to buy a house, right? You want to buy a house, but you don't have the money. So you need to borrow the money. 
And if you borrow the money, well, all you're doing is you're taking out a mortgage. A mortgage is essentially someone saying, you can get access to 250 grand if you give me 25 grand. Okay? And then in exchange for that, you're going to have to pay us interest. Okay? So that's what they do with all these products. They then take debt of debt. So what's a mortgage? A mortgage is debt. And so then they take that debt and they structure it into a product where people can buy it with debt. And then what they do is they dice it further and they take each one of those and they allow people to buy it with debt. And then they go and get another company um, to pay some insurance just in case someone defaults on that debt. And then the, someone takes out the debt of the insurance on the debt. Can anyone see why we're in a messed up situation right now? Yeah. So that's essentially, that all came from the structured products, which was the merging of commercial banking and investment banking. Okay? It was the, you know, taking these different services and putting them together into one way of essentially finding a way to sell more products. Um, you also have corporate banking. So um, the difference between commercial and corporate banking is just what depends whether you're in the States or the UK. In the UK, we call corporate banking in the commercial banking. In the States, commercial banking is retail banking. Um, but they, they also refer to it as retail and, co and corporate banking. So corporate banking is essentially everything that you have with a bank except for you've got mega, mega bucks and you're a limited company or a, a different type of company. Okay? Um, so can you see if someone has banking services where millions is coming in and out, that one day they might want to access some more money or they might want to borrow some money? Yeah? Can you see that? Yeah. So what they will do is they'll go to the investment bank and that's why you get this overlap between the people that create products and the people that actually deposit money and deal with the depositing and lending, okay? What is actually happening in reality is they're taking your money and they're leveraging it a million times over and creating new money and creating our entire money supply. Um, hence the reason why banks are so dominant in the world. But um, if you believe what your, eco your economist tells you at university, um, they're just an intermediary between borrowers and lenders. Um, retail banking, we know what that is. It's uh, simply, it's meant to be in the textbook, uh, deposits and lending. The reality is it's the money creation sector. Um, so they, it's where all of our money in our nation is actually created. Um, people tell you that the government are printing money. That's a lie. The government print only 3% of the money in our, in, our, in, our, in our nation. All of 97% of money is created by a bank privately. So when you take out a mortgage, that's brand new money. <coughs> Um, what else do they do? So it used to be called merchant banking. Now, the reason it was called merchant banking, um, what happened is that when the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933 that separated these commercial banks and investment banks, that was implemented by President Roosevelt after the last, um, after the last depression of the 1930s um, in order to get the economy back to some kind of sustainability. What, in fact, they did do is they created some governmental organizations called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac which were essentially leveraging the government's balance sheet in order to stimulate the property market um, and create the illusion of growth that we've been running over the decades. So really, the government were just essentially taking on all the debt. Um, and that's why the debt has exponentially increased ever since. And we are in this environment right now where we're all maxed out on our credit cards, companies are all maxed out on their credit cards, and the government is certainly maxed out on their credit cards. Why? Because we rely on banks for the creation of money. That's essentially it. In order to have more money, we need to have more debt. If we want less debt, then we have to have less money. So we have a choice. We either take on more debt or we have a depression. That's the double-edged sword, and that's because economics has been preaching wrong theories. That's the rules that we live by today. That's why the collective force of central bankers, governments, politicians can't solve the crisis, because they're just thinking, which one do we want, more debt or a depression? There's only two options in the current system. <coughs> um, merchant banks, so what happened in the Universal Bank, um, this, this whole Glass-Steagall Act was reappealed, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was 1997, um, I think it was before that, basically the th in the UK we had a ton of Thatcherite reforms, which essentially took out, deregulated the banking system. Um, and because investment banks, what do they do? They know how to turn products and, and create tons of money essentially by leveraging the balance sheet of a commercial bank. So they take a commercial bank, they create products which allow them to gain access. That money is created out of thin air, and they can leverage it in order to turn that money into billions. And then they take that money and they buy as many companies in the world. That's why banks own everything now. Okay? So they bought a ton of merchant banks. Merchant banks, what they used to be, they don't exist anymore. There's some of them around, like Rothschild, um, some boutique. What, what they do is they're essentially corporate finance advisory companies. 
They just advise you on how to raise finance, but they don't actually raise the finance for you. An investment bank gives you the corporate finance advice for free, and they make their money of a commission if you raise all your funds. Okay, they'll charge millions on top of the investment um, <coughs> if you raise all your funds. So what happened is the investment banks, when, with the deregulation, they bought all the merchant banks and the boutique companies uh, exited the entrepreneurs that started them up, made a ton of money, and the investment banks made the money through the commercial banks by leveraging their balance sheet. Are you still with me? Yeah. Am I talking a different language or are we together? <laughs> cool. Yeah, sure, let's take some questions. When you said more debt, when you said more debt or yeah. What was yeah. your view on the European outcomes and, and the Singapore? <clears throat> um, well, yeah, the, there's essentially we have, in, in the current crisis, I, this is what I wrote in my book, Bank to the Future, um, we have uh, five outcomes that we can have right now. There's only five possibilities. We either have a complete collapse of the banking system, which, which would be a disaster, um, because 97% of our money supply would shrink into nothing. Um, and the only re the way that would happen is if the government let it happen. So the only way that that would happen is if the government go bankrupt. And the way government will go bankrupt is we all have a credit rating downgrade. So I forecasted, um, I, wrote a I put a video on YouTube called The Great Depression of 2013 um, a, few, a while ago, which was forecasting all the credit rating downgrades. When the credit ratings get downgraded, what they're saying is investors, investment institutions, um, they have to offer them a higher interest rate in order to get them to put their money into lending to the government. Um, once that goes down too far, how many of you fancy investing in Greece right now? That, what, some people might, you know, a huge risk, maybe a hedge fund, might find that quite attractive. Um, but most people would think, I don't want to touch it. You know, most people. Um, why? Why would, you want to, why would anyone want to touch Greece right now? Well, what are they doing? They're, they're what, sorry? They're bankrupt. They're bankrupt, yeah. yeah. The, the lowest point, maybe it's a good investment point. Sure, but let me, let me, it may be a good investment if you're looking at it with tradition, but let me, let me put some common sense glasses on right now, yeah? Greece have debt problems. Does anyone know anyone, maybe not yourself, maybe someone sat there, but does anyone know anyone that's got debt problems? Anyone know anyone? I know a few people that have got serious debt problems. If you advise them, to take on more debt, to pay their debt. Do you think that would be a good solution or a good bit of advice? Well, that's essentially what we're doing. It's never been the debt, more debt has never been the solution to a debt problem. Never, ever. And that's what we're doing. We're just chucking more debt at debt. So if they, if mm. they don't, I mean, if they drop out of the EUC, mm -hmm. it may happen, then that's, that just could be the first card. Yeah, so what they would need to do, and what I propose is that we'd need to then um, take away the license to create money from banks and we need to take it back um, to a centralized power um, Because at the moment I believe and this is just my belief and our school of thought that the reason we're in a mess is because we allow banks to create money um, So essentially that would be my solution So I'd step out of that and then I'd reform the way money's created and forget about the Keynesian economists and the, the Austrian economists and all the um, the, 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 the economists yeah yeah. Um, I, well, here's, that's the third result. You have a governmental bust. So what would happen if a government goes bust? Well, either the ECB, will, a central bank, will bail them out, or they're left to independence in which they'd have to completely reform their banking system in order to take that debt and, and rebuild their country. Um, so that, that is the, the third result, <coughs> um, is that you, you have consolidation of power. Essentially, what I'm forecasting is a European central bank, which essentially is a big Germany, um, they're going to buy up all the countries and all the assets, essentially, and you're going to have this consolidation of power where the European Central Bank... Um, and then what happens when the European Central Bank goes insolvent, like we're already seeing experiences right now? The World Bank will come along. Then you have a global world order, essentially. Um, so it's consolidation of power into larger financial institutions. That's why, if you look at institutions like the IMF, the IMF essentially is um, we say that people contribute money to it and then they bail out um, countries which are in trouble. But if you look at it, um, all the IMF is doing is they're, they're basically finding a new market for their debt. And they're finding new market for their debt in developing countries and um, refinancing our economy and finding new markets for that through imports and exports. Which is why third world countries are 60% deeper in debt bef than before the IMF started and they've repaid their loans six times over. 
So when we say we need to give money, we're never giving money, we're lending money at interest. That's all we're doing. So we're finding new markets for central banks. That's what we're doing, essentially. <coughs> um, so yeah, what did I say? There was five outcomes. So either the banking system goes bust, either the government system goes bust. Um, we have consolidation of power. Um, the other option is that we just make some rules in the way banks actually create money. Um, or essentially, the next phase is to have 100% tax and we live in a communist society. Where we just, and that's what we're heading towards. We, we're, we're just increasing our tax to pay the government's debt, which they owe to the banks, and the banks created out of thin air, and they're benefiting from the interest, and the CEO stepping out with all the bonus. That's what we're having right now, essentially. <clears throat> Need some changes in this sector. Um, so investment institutions, here's what they do. Well, investment institutions, um, you can separate them into wealth management stroke private banking. Uh, this gentleman, what was your name, sorry? Patrick, did I say that right? Okay, I, I didn't say that right. Um, he wants to get into wealth management. Essentially what he's going to be doing is his job is just to find, <laughs> his job is to find as many high net worthers as possible. That's his job. That's it. Just find rich people, you'll be great at the job. The only way you're going to find rich people is by knowing lots of rich people. I'll give you some ideas about how you can do that. Um, <clears throat> sure, yeah. Okay, sorry. Let's take some questions. Yeah, um, creating money, not wealth. Yeah, creating money, sorry. Um, in, in, on that, let me just say that, because 8% of a commercially bank's created money goes to wealth, which is brand new companies, the productive economy, to business to create new value. 91% goes to property, um, creating a property bubble, to commodity speculation and creating products which add no value to the world. Um, um, so there's no value, there's no wealth creation in it. In fact, they're all technical too, but basically mm. they're about money. They're about money. Simply in my head, the banks either got the money or they've not. So if someone goes to a bank looking for money. No, not true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, what I'm saying is worth it. To create money, <coughs> to actually do that, are they just giving out debt? Okay. Or they're giving out debt. Okay. Uh, I'll answer this question quickly, and if you don't get it, then let's have a private conversation and take it off, um, offline. But essentially, when you, when you go to a bank in order to borrow money, um, the bank, the person sat behind the computer doesn't have a clue that they're creating money. Um, they just think that they're actually, but here's what actually happens. If you look at the balance sheet of a bank, <coughs> when you borrow money, they simultaneously create an asset and a liability. Which means that when you, it, 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 sorry if, um, how many of you are financed? Have you done like um, balance sheets and stuff like that? You know they've all got a balance, yeah? So what a bank does is they're completely different to, to every other type of institution. They create an asset and a liability at the same time. So their asset um, is the fact that they've created £250,000 that you need to repay them plus interest. Their liability is that you, they take that money and they deposit it into your account. That's a liability, it's not an asset. Yeah? It's a liability because if anything goes wrong, they, if you try and draw that money, you need, they need to give it to you. So what they've essentially done is the money supply, if you look at the grand economy, if you take out a mortgage for 250 grand, the money supply has increased by 250 grand because they've created a new asset and a new liability and it's new money, essentially. So that's what they're doing. That's why the, the way the, the, their business model is find as many... Now, on the contrary, if you default on that debt, the money disappears. That's called a write-off. That's what we had because money was just disappearing from the economy every time someone defaulted on their debt. So it's not that the bank goes bust, it's that the whole economy goes bust because there's less money in the entire economy. Does that make sense? Um, so they do, that, they do that on the basis of trust? They do that based upon whether they believe that you can repay I mean, and whether they can find people who are willing to pay, uh, that to borrow. Reason for you, you made so many mortgaging with inadequate risk and stuff. <coughs> and yeah. Risk. Or there's another way of doing it. Who cares what their credit rating is? if you just chuck the product over to here and get pensions to put the money up. Yeah? Get all these wealthy people to put the money up. And then so all you've done is you've essentially found the people that are willing to borrow and then sold it to them and you don't really care what the risk is. And that's essentially what happened. <clears throat> Yeah, so there's, there's, there's other ways. So um, I think we're going a bit too technical. There's two types of money supply. There's, 
money created by the Bank of England, which is completely debt free. So, okay, I'll, I'll go into it and then I'm going to move on because it might get too complicated. But um, the way that, the way that, the, has anyone got any cash, coins and cash? That's created by the Bank of England. The way that that's created is the Bank of England has an institution called the Royal Mint who creates coins and they have the Bank of England which actually prints money. That's only 3% of money. That's money, what, what happens is it costs 3p to print a £10 note and they sell it to a bank for £10. So a bank only buys it for one reason, because they need to have money in their cash point. And so all they need to do is provide enough cash for, to meet the people that want to deposit, take money out of a cash point. They, then buy, they buy it for £10. The government, the, the Bank of England makes £9.97 from creating a £10 note. That's not their money though, they gift it to the Treasury. The Treasury is essentially the bank for the government. So when we all pay tax, that goes to the Treasury. Yeah? The money created by the Bank of England is added to tax revenue and is then spent for the benefit of the public through a democratic process. Now that is 3% of the money supply. Um, and that is how, that's, how, that's uh, the only money that bank, the, the Bank of England actually creates. Now, they came up with a new way of doing it, which was creating new products, um, new debt-based products called quantitative easing, um, which was essentially creating new money, which they have the right to do, but doing it through debt, which needs to be repaid plus interest, and just refinancing the mess, essentially. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, so let's get back to where we want to go. I'm happy to have conversations. Um, if any of you want to connect with me on any of the social networks, I'm extremely contactable. Get me on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, anything. Um, you know, I'm happy to chat about these issues. Um, you can't see this right now, but what that says is there's another type of investment institution, which is what we call it asset management, investment management, fund management, portfolio management. Essentially, they're taking insurance money so when you, when, you, when you take out an insurance um, product, essentially what you're doing is they're, they're taking on the risk and they're saying you pay this amount each month and if this goes wrong, subject to our terms and conditions, um, then we'll pay you the money. And the terms and conditions are never in our favour. <coughs> um, but the subject to the term, we'll pay it. And so what they do is they take all that money and that drives a lot of the investment in new business and you know commodities or whatever the banks decide money's going. So essentially, because banks create all the entire money supply, they're dictating policy. It's not government deciding where money goes, it's banks deciding where money goes by issuing loans. And if you're credit worthy, then you can get access to that money. Now that doesn't matter if you're tearing out the world's resources or creating weapons of mass destruction, um, just as long as you're able to repay it, really. So that's why we've got rule by banks, essentially, at the moment. Um, and the other source of big money is us all contributing to our pension. Um, some people don't even know that they're doing that. They just pay their pension. They think it's just sat in this thing and it will come back to them in a few years. But essentially it's driving a lot of the wealth um, for the investment institution to buy the products that the investment banks create and then the investment banks create them by leveraging ordinary people's money and corporate money. Okay? <coughs> Um, and you also have these things called hedge funds. So I talked about um, these structured products where people put, bundle up mortgages and all sorts of stuff. Um, there's something else an investment bank does, which is there's another division. Um, I'll pull these out. They create these products called derivatives. Essentially, a, a good example of a derivative that we can all understand is like a mortgage. It allows you to buy, get access to a house um, without having all the money. Okay. But if the property market crashes, you end up in a situation where you may not be able to sell the house. And if you can't service the mortgage, then the bank will take it back off you. So it's not really your asset, it's just giving you access to it. And essentially that's what derivatives do. They're like mortgages for stocks and shares. Um, and they allow you to get access to invest in the markets um, without having all the money. Now the thing of if you invest without having all the money is that if you make money, you make money a lot quicker. So imagine if you only had 10 grand for a property and you bought a 100 grand property. Um, you didn't have 100 grand and you invested 10 grand, the mortgage and then the price of that property went up a to 110 grand. So the price of the property went up 10%, you with me? It was 100 grand and it was 110. The price of the property went up 10%. Um, now if you had 110 grand and you bought that house outright, you would have made 10% return on your money if you sold the house. Make sense? 
Okay, now if you bought it on a mortgage, you had 10 grand, and then you sold it for 110, gave the bank back their 100 minus the interest and commissions, and you made 100% you made return on your money. Equally, if it goes down, you lose 100%, and if it goes down further, which is many people's situation right now, you're in a negative equity where you, you either default on the loan. Now, what happens when you default on the loan? Money disappears from the economy, the bank has a write down, and that's what the subprime mortgage, which triggered all this essentially off. Um, because people, but why, and why did they actually take out the mortgage in the first place? Because the government wanted more growth in the economy, and how do you grow an economy? When money is debt, there's only one way of creating more growth, take on more debt. So there's been this Ponzi scheme, joint venture partnership between the government and the banks for years, essentially, and that's what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were institutions designed to um, you know, stimulate property. And we've all tried, you know, we've, we've created the illusion of wealth, essentially, when all we've done is, is speculation. That's all we've done. Um, so derivatives. Now, what hedge funds do is they take um, money and they um, are unregulated investment institutions. Regulated investment institutions aren't allowed to take much risk with their money because the FSA doesn't let them in the case of the UK unregulated financial institutions. The reason that they're unregulated is because they're only allowed um, to take money from high net worths that are fully aware and the FSA says you're, you're happy to take the risk, essentially. Um, to, in order to get into a hedge fund, typically it used to be you'd have to have a, million of, a minimum of a million pound investment. But what's happened now is a load of boutiques have come out of the financial crisis and you can invest for 100 grand and then sometimes less. Um, so the, you know, the, the gray area of is they sophisticated, aren't they sophisticated? But what hedge funds do is they, they, they take a million pounds of people's money, leverage it up to a billion and then invest it essentially. So you can make a lot or you can lose a lot. Okay? <clears throat> um, in, in fact, it's not necessarily the case because hedge funds also adopt strategies where whether the market goes up or down, you don't necessarily lose money. Um, so they can be less risky than um, a traditional pension. In fact, many hedge funds are producing much better returns than a traditional pension right now. So it's not necessarily that they take more risk, but there is inherent risk in the products that they're actually uh, taking on. Um, you get this little crossover here between investment institutions and investment banks. Let me tell you why. So hedge funds, they're one of the most lucrative and profitable um, financial institutions out there because essentially they can make millions if not billions from only a few staff. Um, because most of their capital is the fund manager, this brain, or a computer system which trades for them. That's most of their capital. In order to actually run that computer system, it just takes a couple of grads and six fund managers or so. So essentially an investment bank has to employ, so JP Morgan employs 250,000 people in order to run that operation. But hedge fund can do the, you know, run it for six, and the margin that they can make on the business is a lot harder, um, higher. Sorry. Um, so what, what investment banks realized is that tons of investment bankers were quitting their jobs and starting up their own little um, boutique hedge funds. And they were thinking, well, how can we capitalize on this? Because um, we're losing tons of our staff to these boutique hedge funds. And around about, you know, it, it, throughout the 2000s, we had thousands of hedge funds being created. Because they realized, you know, I, I don't want to work that many hours as I have to work in an investment bank. And so what they did is the investment bank said, um, I tell you what, because you're a hedge fund, why don't you just focus on trading strategies? And what we'll do is we'll get you access to the capital, we'll get you with HR staff, We'll find you all the back-sourced operations, everything that we've invested millions, billions in in the bank, and you can borrow it and just pay us a fixed fee each month. So what prime broking is, is it's an outsourced back office and you know, it's an outsourced service for hedge funds to gain access to a lot of the resources. So if anyone wants to work in prime broking, your job is to know fund managers. That's it. Okay so that you can sell the monthly service for leveraging basically the assets that the investment bank has um, so that they can run as a small operation. <clears throat> and finally, we've got the last two things, broking and research. So what is uh, a research analyst? Now, there's two different things. If you're a research analyst for this company, then your job is to report buy and sell recommendations. Now, if you look at the research analyst industry, it is 80% biased towards buy recommendations. 
as in only 20% of research analyst recommendations say you should sell this stock. 80% bias. Do you think that the 80% of all the stocks right now should be bought? So why do research analysts have an 80% bias towards buy? Where do they work? What's this called? The sell side. What does sell side do? Sell. So if you can put in a newspaper, buy, 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 what happens to your sales? And if you can put a credibility piece on them and say they're a CFA, they're very credible, um, but if you say sell on that, you're not allowed to say it. You'll have to say weak buy or something like that, you know. Or what do we, what do we, yeah, yeah. Um, so the research analysts that work for the sell side Essentially, their job is to work with the investment bankers in order to sell more stocks, okay? And they have to go around to all the investment corporate finance meetings and meet the CEOs and make an, some analysis that allows make some very attractive graphs so that they can then sell those products to the investors, okay? The brokers, what they do is they, they, they take our money, yeah? So small money, essentially, we're, we're just dropping, no matter how rich you are, we're dropping the pool, you know, compared to um, this kind of money. Um, so if you've got a grand or 10 grand and you want to invest in stocks, you have to go through a broker. A broker will then have the relationship with the investment bank and it pulls together all the small retail money. So my business angel um, at Benedict's, he's a gentleman called Peter Hargreaves, he owns a wealth management company, um, but he also has a retail brokerage. Um, so he takes care of high net worth people, and accountants, lawyers, and anyone that wants to invest in the, the financial markets. Um, so, and also a lot of the investment banks, what they did during the Thatcherite reforms and the, the, the breakdown of Glass-Steagall Act is they bought tons of the brokers. So all of the small <coughs> and medium-sized companies consolidated into the universal banks, where you have these mega banks that do everything. They create money, they leverage money, find, create products to sell, and they also have the companies that buy it, and they put them all together in this massive conflict of interest called banking. Okay? Custody, not worth going through. Essentially, you'll see, you'll see companies like, um, the, the, like Bank of New York, um, Mellon. They basically provide the back office for um, investment banks that don't have a lot of the resources. In this category, I put companies like um, credit rating agencies like Fitch as well. Um, they provide services where they rate products that allows investment banks to sell more products. Um, and then when they go wrong, they downgrade them rather than rating them badly in the first place because uh, they earn their commission from the investment bank. Have I painted a rosy picture of banking and finance? OK. Well, these are all the things. These are all the challenges. But here's the thing. Banking and finance, we cannot live without it. Um, without it, our economy would be you know, in this crazy, well, we'd be in a dire situation. Actually, that's not the truth, and it's an interesting debate, because now we have all the technology in the world to live without banks. But the only reason we've got banks is because we need to create money, because 97% of money is created. You know, we've got systems where you can put together borrowers and lenders without a bank. We've got systems where people can exchange ideas without a bank. We've got systems which, you know, remember before banks, before money, we used to have barter. And barter is where you'd exchange a goat for a sheep, and you have to find someone. That can work pretty well with Facebook now, can't it? You know, that barter system could work pretty well with the technological innovation that we have right now. Anyway, um, so, so that's the complete overview. Now, my suggestion for you is uh, figure out and spend a lot of time figuring out, if you want to go into banking and finance, where you're going to put your passion in. Because each one of those is going to require a different amount of jargon, a different amount of contacts, and a different amount of focus. So if you're going for all of them, you'll be doing what I did and getting rejected from 250 graduate schemes after doing your master's. Yeah? If, you're going, if you know that I want to be a wealth manager like this gentleman does, um, then you'll, you'll, you know who you need to connect with, you know what you need to do, you know what job you need to pick up, you know what qualification you need to pick up, um, and you'll get on that focus path to where, towards where you want to go. It may take you a while, but you'll get there. Okay? Um, Fiona, how are we doing for time? Uh, about half an hour. Half an hour, okay. Um, <clears throat> Let me, go, let me go on and see what else I wanted to do. Um, and all of this industry is, um, all of these institutions, they all have to have insurance, 
and insurance provides a lot of money for the investment institutions. So essentially there's a joint venture between the insurance company and the investment institutions, and some of the insurance company own a lot of the investment institutions. Um, everyone in the world needs to pay tax and have accounting. Um, so we've got this massive um, accounting you know, tax dealing with all these industries. Um, everyone in the world, um, there's a big industry called consulting where everyone takes their expertise um, and they outsource it to a consulting institution in order to find and investigate the things that they don't have time to find out and investigate and specialist knowledge. And it's all going to be done in a legal framework where we don't have too many issues. Um, which we continually have issues, but everything essentially, can you just see, it's just contract law. All it is is exchange of ownership of different products and someone loses and someone wins. And we call that an economy. Okay? So uh, you've got these massive industries which cement and build all this all together and that's what we call banking and finance. Has that, has that helped? Has that cleared up some, like, is that, is that a way where you can understand what it is? Yeah? Anyone knew all that before? They were bored for the last hour or so? You did, didn't you? Okay. All right. Okay, well, thank you for bearing with me for an hour or so. <clears throat> what have we got next? Let's see if we've got something that you don't know. Okay. Strategy. What I'd like to do is uh, Fiona asked me if I could share some of the trends that I think are going to be coming up over the next five years um, so that you can plan your careers accordingly. Um, and I think there's seven of them which you need to really be concern yourself with. And these seven trends um, sh will, will, they're my forecast. You can slap me in the face, you can say, I don't believe you, I say, think you're, you're talking rubbish. That's okay. But, you know, let's debate them on the social networks, whatever you want to do with them. Um, but this is just from my experience of working with entrepreneurs, from working with a lot of VCs, from owning a couple of businesses, um, from being around a lot of people in banking and finance, from working with politicians, uh, from writing a couple of books, going on TV and doing a lot of stuff where a lot of people come and give me a lot of information because I've, I've got a good network now. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is we are in an entrepreneurial revolution. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. All those graduates that cannot get jobs right now are sat at home right now figuring out how to earn money. And they're sat at home figuring out how to create an iPhone app. They're sat at home figuring out how to create a website. They're sat at home figuring out how to create an own little niche business. Why? The reason that we're in an entrepreneurial revolution is because before, in the industrial revolution, um, and I quote my good friend Daniel Priestley who wrote a book, Become a Key Person of Influence, um, in the Industrial Revolution, you had to have a factory in order to own a business. In order to own a factory, you had to have land. In order to have land, you had to have gone from the right pedigree, or you just had to be an absolute freaking genius to figure out if you didn't come from the right family. Okay? So you used to inherit wealth before in the Industrial Revolution. And you had two types of people, factory workers and factory owners. Factory owners took all the money, and factory workers worked for them and made them all the money. Now what's happened now is we're in the entrepreneurial revolution. Why? Because a bunch of geeks have sat at home and created these things called Facebook, which is act accessed. So you don't need to be on TV in order to market your message anymore. And YouTube means that you don't need to be on TV and have massive budgets in order to market and get a particular message out there anymore. And also, in order to start a business, essentially all you need is a laptop, an internet connection, and a smartphone. Because billions of people around the world have created little businesses, which means that we don't need to be programmers and do all the hard stuff that we don't, need to do, that we don't know how to do anymore. So what we have done is we have democratized media. Not there yet. There's still, you know, the main, the main TV media is essentially still um, the, the main voice. But YouTube made a pretty good dent on that because I can't even remember the last time I tried to look up some news on the TV. You know, I just put in the search engines and find in YouTube the information that I want and I can get a two-way perspective on what I'm trying to find out. So we've had all these social networks. We've had PayPal come along and figure out how we can all become little merchant providers when before you used to have a big relationship with a bank and have to have a minimum amount of capital in your bank in order to set up in your business. So right now we are in the midst of an entrepreneurial revolution, which is a ton of people have just got laid off. Now, they're not looking, a lot of them aren't looking for a new job. They're deciding, I've built all this expertise. I can just sell that expertise as a freelancer. 
I can just get a contract with Goldman Sachs and sell my information and work with them for 10 grand. You know, and that's one month's worth of work. And that's actually, I get to keep all that. So we're having a lot of people. What do you think the biggest risk to Deloitte KPMG is right now? Their own staff. Their own staff are taking all their clients and all their knowledge and creating their own businesses. And why? Because we're happy to work with boutique companies. Why? Because we're not happy with big companies anymore. Because we don't get the service we need. We don't like them anymore. We'd much rather work with a specialist small company that is specializes in exactly, why is that? Because you can target like a niche. You can target right now, and I think that's trend number two. <clears throat> We're in a niched economy. It was never possible before to work just with students and graduates who want to work in banking and finance, that want to be CEOs and write a book and find as many people in that. Now that's possible. Why? Because we have access to the whole world. We have access to America, we have access to Europe, we have access to everywhere. The, 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 the borders have completely closed down. So now you can be completely niched. You don't want to be a, a generalist, don't get any opportunity right now. Would you rather work with someone, for example, if you needed an accountant right now, if you wanted to do something, if you needed an accountant, would you rather work from an accountant at Deloitte or would you rather work with the accountant who wrote a bit a book especially on how students can get started in business and use accountancy services in their first year if you were looking to start a business. Well, you'd look for that niche that only specializes in people in your situation and how to take their, their student loans and leverage it for tax benefit. So everyone can have a complete niche right now. So you don't want to be, what, what you want to do is you want to pitch yourself in a way where you specialize really well in one thing. If you do that, people will be attracted to you or they'll be detracted. And that's what you want. You don't want everyone to be attracted to you because generalists don't win. No one wants to work with a generalist right now. They want to work with specialists. And so your job right now is to figure out what's your specialist. Now be careful which specialist you choose because you don't want to do a specialism that you don't enjoy because you're going to spend the rest of your life doing that, or you've got to pivot and change later. And pivoting and change is hard. Why? Because now all our data is available on the social network. And if you look unfocused on your LinkedIn profile, people don't want to do business with you or they don't want to employ you. They want to see that you're completely focused uh, and you've gone down a logical path. And so when employers are looking at you, they're, they're doing the Google test. The Google test is what happens when you put your name in Google. If nothing comes up, you're nothing. Google tells you who you are. Google tells you your reputation. If nothing comes up, if you don't have videos or thought leadership, if you don't have a blog, if you don't have an opinion, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile that's focused, if you don't have great connections on your LinkedIn profile, people will think you're nothing. And if someone else comes up on your name, then they're the person that, that is taking your brand. So what's happened? We're all a brand now. Companies have been branding themselves for years. Now we all need to brand ourselves because we, as soon as we go for an interview, they're gonna put our name in Google. And if drunk photos come up of you in Facebook, then that's your brand. <laughs> that's it. So be very careful of what data you put into the social networks because that's your brand. Facebook changed the game when they created the timeline. That's the ultimate recruitment tool. You can find exactly, I'm not saying whether this is wrong or right, it's an invasion of our privacy, but hell, if I'm gonna employ someone, I wanna know who they really are, not the fake person that gives me a CV and says all the things that I wanna hear at an interview. I wanna know them, the real person. How do you know that? By asking their friends, seeing who they're connected with and looking in Google, yeah? So if you don't have a brand in Google, and that, that, that brand, then that has to be niched. The game's completely changed. It's completely changed rapidly. It's really fast. So while we're in the most crazy economy of ever, we're also in the most exciting economy ever. And that's what I talked about in my book, Bank to the Future. We're in this economy where we're in a debt trap which is guaranteed, inevitable, predictable to crash, burn and fail. We've got to fix that one because all we're doing is shoving more debt at, at debt, which isn't going to solve the problem. But we're also in a time like no other where you can sit at home with a laptop and internet connection and a smartphone and create the own, your own life. 
And many people are choosing that right now. And many people are struggling knocking on graduate schemes doors, trying to get a job when they've got nothing to offer you, when they're just looking to get rid of people right now. And what are the companies doing? Basel two, you know, the rule, Basel three, the regulations are coming out, and all they're doing is they've got to find a ton of money. Where are they going to get that money? They're going to get rid of staff and they're going to replace them with computers. That's what they're going to do. We are designing technology right now with one intention. Any technology that you can create that has the specific intention of replacing humans with computers will do very well. And that's what we're doing right now. We're just gradually chipping away at human capital and replacing it with computers. And everything that we used to sell is becoming free. We're used to free for everything. We're in a free economy, free Facebook, free Google, free search. We want everything for free. We don't want to pay for things anymore, free information. Yeah? So we're moving to this economy of free, but what's the danger of free? Is that someone's got to pay for all the staff to work. And if you can't sell your products and you've got to give them away free, you're just driving unemployment. And that's another trend that we're experiencing right now. That trend is not going to reverse. It's not turning around. This unemployment, we are in the unemployment economy. It is not turning around. Governments cannot stimulate employment. They're fighting the trend. All they're going to do is go bankrupt in the process because they can't fight this trend. So you've got to figure out, what am I going to do about this? Interesting times. It could be the worst time ever or the best time ever. Which one is your choice? You've got to choose what you're going to focus on. You've got to choose the way you're going to do stuff. You have some decisions to make. It's so, an unemployment trend, though, and that's not going to get better. It's, it's not going to get better, no. What's the end result? Well, I think the end result is that we're going to have teams of outsourced people. We're going to have, you know how Hollywood works? Has anyone, does anyone know anyone that works for a film? No, it's a team of freelance contractors that all have niche expertise that get together for a specialist product and they all create a, a, a film. And all of them are like, let's make this film happen because if it doesn't happen, I ain't getting paid. So now we're replacing employment contracts with contractors, freelancers, and outsourcers. Yeah? So if you're chasing employment contracts, you're fighting the trend. I'm not saying you won't get it because there's still going to be jobs. Of course there will. But the trend is this. We're moving in this direction. The third thing is we're in a boutique economy, as I've said um, again and again and again. What happened during the crisis? Well, there was still business. Yes, our economy contracted as more people defaulted and there was less money in the economy as money disappeared. But what happened is the boutique large financial institutions got a ton of bad publicity. And all of a sudden, the person coming in and saying, please apply for RBS, didn't seem that attractive anymore. And so what happened is a lot of staff got laid off and they set up tons of little companies. We are the boutique investment bank that specializes in technology startups that are looking to raise between 100 million and 150 million on the alternative investment market specializing just in the UK. There's tons of companies like that right now. If you look at that, with the boutiques, with the bulge brackets, there's about 50 companies in the UK. With the medium-sized companies, there's about 800 in bank, banks and financial institutions. Boutiques has about 1,000 of them. Most students and graduates I know, they apply to 20 graduate schemes and then think, sod it, banking and finance isn't for me. Yeah? <clears throat> so we're moving towards the boutique economy where the boutique is winning. Why? Because they're essentially outsourcing their high-end services, the expensive stuff, to the bulge brackets the bulge brackets are paying the bill, and the boutiques are getting high margin where they only have to employ a few people, and they're adopting technology. Why can they adopt technology faster? Oh my God, did you know that banking, um, I've, I've, you know, when I've, I wrote a business plan for a bank because we we're founding a new bank called Bank to the Future. Um, and what we, you know, there's no need for branches, all this stuff that we run. Our banks are run off a 30-year-old system. Nowadays, the future people, you, the next generation, you just want to go on your phone. You don't want to go. If someone says, come into a branch and open, to your, open your bank account, do you want to go into the branch and sign paper and meet the bank manager and sit there for an hour giving photocopies of your utility bills and stuff like that? Or do you just want to click on your Facebook friend and pay them 10 quid and it just go through you tapping your mobile smartphone, which has got all your data, and you, you fingerprint it, and then it identifies you through biometric science. 
you know, that's what, that's what we're doing. But can banks do that? They've got to get write-off from 250,000 staff and go through all sorts of administration in order to get something like that. But a small company can come along and just wipe it out. PayPal did it. Peer-to-peer -peer lending did it. You know, we're seeing these small boutiques coming along and doing things which look an awful lot like a bank, but without all the, without all the, you know, the 250,000 staff and all that stuff that comes along with it and the headaches. So we're moving to a boutique economy. We're also moving to a freelance economy, um, whereby, um, as we said, free unemployment, uh, sorry, employment contracts are being replaced by contractors. Um, attraction beats application. So um, one of the things that we do when we work with students is we put together strategies for them to attract people to them. Attraction comes from being an asset. An asset that can pitch himself. I'll give you a formula later of what you need to do in order to attract instead of um, apply. But application is the least effective way of applying for a job. Here's why. If you are applying for a job, you're probably too late because all the shit jobs go to the application process. <coughs> all the good jobs come from connections. Here's what I used to do. We, we used to work on the trading floor. And the first thing, before they ever applied to a job, would they say, right, we've got this job coming up in trading. Does anyone know anyone? And if we didn't refer anyone, um, then they'd start reaching out to, OK, let's pay a recruiter in order to find someone. And if a recruiter couldn't find someone, then let's put it on a job board. And if a job board can't find anyone, then let's do, you know. By the time you got there, you've got the, the, you know, the jobs which are, any jobs which is being advertised, you're probably too late. What you want to be is you want to be building a brand with people where they understand your unique value proposition and what you have to offer. And it's not that you change what you do in order to fit into them. It's that everyone understands you and you pitch yourself and your niche so well that people come to you once the opportunity arises. And as long as you've got a brand out on the social networks and a Google brand, then people will find you. And as long as you just go out there and meet new people all the time, eventually you'll find the resources that you need in order to attract some kind of offer at that point. So right now, all the job opportunities right now, and there are there, I know tons of financial institutions which come to me every day, Simon, can you just refer me to someone? Can you just find me someone that you've been working with for the last couple of years that you know is good, you know can deliver results, um, and you know is really passionate about this, and they're not just going to leave me within a year and use us to get somewhere? Yeah? And that's where all the jobs are going right now. So your network is vitally important in an attraction economy as opposed to an application economy. Application is when there's tons of jobs and everyone's recruiting and they need to find people as fast as they can and everyone's competing for the best students and the best grads. That doesn't exist anymore. It's not there. We're just not there. <clears throat> the sixth trend we're seeing right now is we had a flood of higher education. So de degrees are no longer the distinguisher right now. They are important when you're applying. In, they are important in the attraction economy to give you credibility. But if you can prove your value and you can just do the job, then it becomes less and less relevant. I can't remember the last time I had to talk about my degree. Now, I know I've been doing a lot of stuff since I was a student, so I've got a lot of credibility in the things I can achieve. Um, but, and I know that right now, you may, and I'm not saying you do, in fact, you don't, but you may think that the degree is your only asset right now. You actually have a lot more that you don't know about. You just don't know how to pitch it, and you don't know how to do it. You've got to get involved in lots of activities on the side of education. I'm sure the careers department have a ton of things you can do. If you want to work in banking and finance and you're not a part of your investment society, you are a sin. It's a sin. It's a sin. Because your investment society can be an asset that you can leverage in order to find all the contacts and connections that you need. If you're doing it wise, if you're using the right strategies, Remember, you've got to get the strategy right. Most people are going to investment societies. They're bored thinking, why am I coming here? They're not using it as the asset. You are at university. You have way more time than when you work in an investment bank. You've got the ideal opportunity right now. Question? That's not actually set up yet, but we're in the process of doing it. Are you going to set it up? It's uh, myself and another guy from Hodge. Hodge the president, so I'm like... Okay, cool. Um, I would much rather employ the founder of the University of Liverpool Investment Society. Um, than that has the same degree as everyone else or the same masters or same MBA as everyone else. The investor, you know, is, is really, really important to get involved in these activities. Um, when you don't have experience, you still need to come across as experienced today. 
which means you have to make your own experience. How did I get my first job as a trader? I said that I was the founder of a trading club. What did that consist of? That was me and a few mates that met every few weeks in order to discuss trading, and we just started learning how to trade. I lost a load of money doing it, but we just started. We just got there, and then we went out there, and we found financial institutions <coughs> that were looking to leverage our network, that wanted to promote products to our network, and I started building my contacts one at a time. And that's how it all started. It can all start with a society. Um, OK, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to ask, um, do you think trading your own money? Mm -hmm. I OK, let me, let me go with that. You want, you want to be a trader? Yeah. Um, do you know which, which area, what, what type of, what's your attitude towards risk? Tell me, are you a risk taker? If the rewards warrant the risk, yeah. OK, so you're, you, you, you look at the downside quite a lot, yeah? I take risk neutral. OK. Um, there's three types of roles in trading, and I'll just give you this. One is working for an investment bank. And that normally is where you're a market maker or a sales trader. And it's all in the name, sales trader. Your job is to find people that want to buy stocks and sell stocks. It's a sales related role, okay? Now as a market maker, you also take some, some risk on. This is useful stuff, guys. Um, as a market maker, you want to take some kind of risk on as well. Now that's the least riskiest role, working for an investment bank as a trader. There's also a, an intermediary role, which is called a proprietary trader. Now, that's what you want to be, yeah? A proprietary trader, there's two things. You can either trade the investment bank's money. That job doesn't really exist for graduates. You've got to have a tra track record of trading. You could have your own track record, um, but normally they'll employ people from the fund management, hedge fund management industry. Or you can work for a prop house. Now, a prop house is a boutique financial... If anyone wants to work for a prop house, contact me. I'll introduce you to the right people. Um, they are always, they're just looking for anyone that can make a profit. If you can prove you can make a profit, then they'll give you an opportunity. And if you can't make, if you haven't got an evidence right now, they may, there's, there's some companies which may even charge you to do their training course. Now, yes, yeah, Schneider, they, I don't think they charge right now. Their business model might change, so I don't want to say it on camera. But um, they, yeah, there's, there's quite a few prop houses. They might charge you in order to be a trader. Now, many people think that's really dodgy. It, it, it may not be right for you, but that's their business model. If you, if you are right for trading, then they'll give you a ton of money to trade their money. They'll give you a commission. It's like a very entrepreneurial role. They're just looking for entrepreneurial people. Um, and you've got to be able to support yourself for the next nine months because you're probably not going to make any money for the next nine months. Now, the ultimate risk is to trade your own money. And that's why all these intermediary institutions exist, because none of them trade their own money. Why? Because 90% of the people lose money, only 10% make money. Now, if you want to be a trader, then here's my advice. If you want to do it at home, then I think you're having the right trend. You've got to be the right risk profile. Um, and get yourself a mentor. And a mentor is somebody that consistently makes trades and can show you their trades, not someone that's selling a course. Okay? They can consistently show you their trades, and you need to, you need to get yourself a mentor. Because it is a tips in trading. Trading is just about this. It's psychology. Um, you can pick any strategy that works 50% of the time. And if you do, it's risk management, which, is, which you already alluded to, and it's, um, it's psychology. Um, that's where you spend most of your time. So in answer to your question, does trading your own money help? Absolutely does it help. Um, if you work for a prop house and you want to get into an investment bank, they'll frown upon you. Um, they don't like each other. The investment banks think, no, we don't want to work with those scum. The, the traders think we don't want to work with those toffs. Yeah? So there's a different mindset. So making that decision early on is really important. Can you see the benefit of focus? Yeah. OK, cool. Um, and number seven is the social media revolution. We've already gone um, by that. Um, what you put into LinkedIn, LinkedIn is your CV. Forget about paper, it doesn't exist anymore. You've got to have it? Yeah, OK, have a CV. Um, they will wait for it. Be prepared. Here's a, here's a tip to a CV. A CV is not a place for you to write down everything you've, you've done. A CV is a place where you match all the things that you've achieved that match up to the exact role that you're looking to apply to. And if you're sending a generic CV to all the financial institutions like I did, you'll get rejections. A CV is a document where you apply for the exact company you want to work for and you tailor it and write it for that company. So rather than applying for tons of places, just decide the ones you want to work for, work on a strategy to get in there, build your connections there, write the perfect CV. Um, for that. So, but your CV now is LinkedIn. What, it's really, really important. Here's some tips. Um, make sure you use your real photo when it's professional. 
Don't have a Facebook profile where you're a dog or a Fred Flintstone or something like that. You want to look like, you want to look the part. Would you want to take that person on? You don't want to take on Fred Flintstone. You want to take on someone that looks the part. Have your real name. Your real name needs to match your business card. Have your business card because all the other students won't have them. Yeah? Have your business card and make sure that the name on your business card matches the name on your LinkedIn because I know many people have different names um, as you come to this country and you change your name and stuff like that. Make it easy for people to find you and learn how Google works and make sure you learn how to optimize your name so that when your name comes up, the right stuff comes up. Okay? That's what we need to do. And social media is the perfect way of doing that. And what social media essentially has done is it has opened up the world to you. I would never apply for a job. I just look for the people I need to connect with on LinkedIn, give them a value proposition. Um, don't value extract. What, I, I've got this thing, I, I coined this term, you'll read it in the book, called value proposition. A value proposition means that whenever there's a contact, most people will come and try and extract some value. They'll say, how do I do this? What do I do that? How do I get that? Will you look at my CV? Can you get me a job? The one person that comes up and says, you know, Simon, I really enjoyed that presentation. I know that you're looking to achieve this. I've got some contacts that I'd love to introduce. Can I have your email address? Way more effective than, can I have your email address? I need you to check my CV. Can you get me a job? Yeah? So that's called value extraction versus value creation. Um, an abundant mindset that's going to work is all focused around every day I'm focused, how can I add more value to my network? How can I add more value? Anytime I want something is how can I do 10 times more for them in order to get one back? That's what I focus all my day on. Um, and there's the seven trends. So what have we done? I think I just got a final formula. How are we doing for time? Two, three minutes. OK, I'm just going to give you a little formula. Um, and this is probably just going to confuse you. But um, the key is um, how big, if, if you want to work in trading, the first question I'll ask you is how many traders do you know? That's the first. I won't ask you what your degree is. I won't ask you, you know, anything else. If you say you want to be an investment banker, I'll say how many investment bankers do you know? If you say zero, then I'll say that's where you need to focus your time and attention. You need to increase your network um, of investment bankers. That's what you need to do. Um, if, you, if you don't have any right now, then that's immediately your focus. Um, and you can do that in, you know, that's what we work with people. We have a network and we help people. Um, we've recently launched a, a, a new website. It's, it's in beta at the moment, but if anyone wants to create their profile, it's called banktalkshow.com. Um, that's a social network just for students and graduates who want to work in banking and finance and want to connect with um, thought leaders in banking and finance. So we interview like, you know, big people in banking and finance, authors, publishers, you know, all sorts of different people, hedge fund managers, traders, CEOs, we've done all of them. Um, so you can join up and create your profile. The vision is that that's going to come up number one in Google eventually, and employers are going to look at your Bank to the Future profile, sorry, Bank, bank Talk Show um, profile um, before they consider, you know, what you're up to and how you're interacting with other contacts in banking and finance. That was the vision of why we created that. I created something called the Naked Formula. You can just write this down because um, I'm, I'm going to be, um, I think I'm out of time right now. Um, the Naked Formula is as follows. Um, here's, here's what you need to do in order to succeed to build all your contacts. MPP times APP, um, sorry, add KPI, add ED, add DVP. And I think I'm out of time. <laughs> That's all you need to know. That will get you everything you want. MPP stands for a niched perfect pitch. Spend a lot of time figuring out how to pitch. Really important. You want to wow people in 30 seconds, in 5 seconds, in 10 seconds, in half an hour, in an interview, in 3 hours. You need to have your pitch prepared. Don't wait till you meet influential people to know how to pitch yourself. Work on your pitch up front. The first thing is to pitch yourself and a pitch has to be a niche. It's got to be, here is who I am, and here's what I'm about, and here's what I do. Like me or hate me, here's what I do. This is what I'm about. This is my passion. This is what I'm going to be working on. You know, and you can either come on board or you can't, but this is me. Okay? You want to come across as that, not flaky. An attractive personal brand means the Google test. It means that it's a personal brand where they can clearly determine your values and your pitch by putting your name in Google and they understand what you're about. Those are the people which are getting opportunities right now. If they don't understand you, they won't give you any opportunities, they won't contact you, they've got no reason to know you. Okay? I know it's brutal, uh, but... Sorry, yeah. but uh, 
if there are people with the same name on Google, <laughs> <laughs> then you have to beat them. <laughs> it, it is. Is, is, is. Is Tom Cruise here today? Is there a Tom Cruise? You're going to have a hard time beating him. Yeah, no. Yeah, um, yeah you want to you spend a lot of time trying to get. What's your name? Uh, Marco Maravese. You can find easily my name on, on Google, but there are a lot of people in Italy yeah. with the same name. Yeah. <laughs> so as, as long as Google. A lot of people, people uh, a lot of pictures of drunk yeah. people. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Um, yeah, I mean, you, you just got to learn how to use the search engines. Um, six months of effort, and you can make your name come up to number one. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure someone. I'm sure someone in this room knows how to make that happen. And that's where you all need to start working together as a team. By the way, I find that a lot of people at university they compete with each other. Big mistake. Big mistake. Um, the cooperative opportunity that you have at university to build your connections together. Um, when you all understand what you're all about, it is really, really a massive opportunity. It all begins here. It all begins with the people in this room. I'm sure there's tons, if you knew everyone in this room and what they do and everyone knew how to pitch himself, I'm sure you'd find tons of opportunity just in this room right now. There'd be businesses created, there'd be job opportunities, there'd be referrals, all in this room. It's all here. Start from here. Um, KPI I stole from a friend of mine called Daniel Priestley. It's called a key person of influence. A key person of influence has several characteristic traits about them. So if you look at the income distribution at the moment, the, if you look at the income distribution, it looks something like this, where you have 1% earning all of the money in the nation, and you, have a tiny, and you have tons and tons and tons of people earning a small amount. A key person of influence, I recommend you read the book. It's a good book as well. Um, they know how to get ex on the right side of that exponential curve. They're at the center of the industry. It's where all the fun happens. It's where all the opportunities occur. What you'll find at Goldman Sachs, there's tons of people that get paid 40 grand, and then there's a few people that get paid millions. It's not fair. It's not fair at all. But what, what are they? They're, they are what we call vital people. They're vital because they are actually have a niche. They have the connections and that you want to get from a position, your full-time job is to get to a position of being vital. Um, and that's what we call a key person of influence. ED is an evidence document. That's a, 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 coin, a, a phrase that I coined um, because I hated the word CV because I used to get, I get tons of CVs all the time. Everyone sends me their CV. I'm an MSc at University of Manchester. Can you get me a job in investment banking? Here's my CV. Boring. Delete. An evidence document is tailored specifically for a particular value proposition. So when you want to work for a specific company, it's specifically tailored for you being the ideal candidate for that particular opportunity. Okay? And all it does is it lists the evidence that you're the perfect person. Okay? And there's ways of leveraging what your experience is in order to, to build an evidence document. I can't stand CVs. Um, and the final thing is um, deliver value propositions, DVP. Value propositions I've already touched upon right now. It's the difference between someone that's vital and someone that's not. It's the difference between someone that stands out. If you all hand me my business card right now, there'll be one of you that will say something to me that will stand out. And that will be because you give me a value proposition rather than value extracting. And you'll be the person that will get the connection, the opportunity, and the next thing. And it's a natural thing for us to tr try and meet someone and extract as much value because it's like this opportunity to meet someone and learn something new. Um, but when you do it this way, you get all the information because you build a partnership and a relationship with them. Write this down just before I finish, the three things I'd love you to take away. For the last 10 years, I've been doing three things. All I did is I had no connections and I asked the following three questions. Anytime I met someone, I asked them, what are you up to in the world? If they could answer that, then I'd understand a little bit more about them. Most people can't answer that. Most people don't have a clue what they're up to in the world. Yeah? From that, when they ask you, the second question is, what's your key challenges right now in making that happen? And if you can answer that, then you know what their problems are. And if you know what their problems are, you then know how to solve it. So you ask more questions around their problem. And the third question you ask is, who would you need to know in order to make that happen? And they'll tell you, for example, if someone asked me right now, I tell you that I'm pitching VCs right now, we're looking to raise three million pounds for a startup seed um, in, a, in an alternative financial institution. 
Um, and then you could say, well, okay, you'd respond to that by saying, well, Simon, I don't know any VCs right now, but I'm doing a ton of networking. And if I come across anyone that's right for you, then I'd love to introduce you to. Would it be okay if I got your email address so I can do that? They'll say, sure. Yeah? And they'll remember you. They'll be like, wow, that person was pretty, you know, everyone else was asking me how to look at their CV. Stuff. <clears throat> and then you go home and you put together a spreadsheet. And on that spreadsheet, you put the name Simon Dixon. Here's what he's looking to achieve. And then you go and do that 200 times. And in that will be a match. Someone's looking to invest. Someone's looking to... All you do is match make people. You send an email. Simon, ages ago, I spoke... Uh, six months ago, I spoke to you um, about you're looking to raise funds. I just met this VC. I thought I'd do an introduction. I'm not sure if you're, you know, the opportunity's there, but I'll leave you two to speak. You contact them uh, a, a couple of weeks later and say, how did you get on with that meeting? Was it a useful connection? They'll say yes or no. And if they say yes, they will want to do you a favor. They will feel guilty. They will want to repay you. It's called the law of reciprocity. It's a natural human law that when someone does you a favor, you want to do something back. Do that for the next 10 years. You will know everyone you want to know. You will achieve everything you want to achieve. You'll have the complete network. You'll be exactly where you want to go. It's hard work. There's no quick way. I guarantee you, you'll be able, if you just take those three questions, I've been doing that for 10 years and that's allowed me to build all the connections I want. If I ever want to achieve anything, it's a phone call away. If, I, if any of my businesses go bankrupt tomorrow, if everything goes wrong in my life, I know that I've got a ton of people that will say, Simon's going through a real challenge right now. His business just went bankrupt. What can we all do in order to pull him back up again and get started again? And that's because I've been adding value to people for 10 years. Okay? Cool. Take that away um, and you'll, do, you'll get a ton of things. You'll get to where you want to go. There's the summary. I hope you've uh, enjoyed that. I'm sorry if I took too long. Um, I get a little bit excited. I haven't spoke to students for a while. I've been doing a lot of business presentations with uh, entrepreneurs right now. And I look forward to connecting with you on all the social networks and hopefully sharing the journey of your success. Thank you very much.